Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Shin Yang Yim. Today, I am going to tell you about congenital muscular torticollis. The first, what is a normal head and neck posture? The normal head and neck posture does not show any tilt or slope. While there are several ways to measure the slope of the head and neck, an easy way is to measure the angle between the line connecting the eyes and the horizontal line of the ground with a baby in a stable position like this picture. The first picture shows a normal head and neck posture without any tilt. The second one shows 20 degrees of right tilt. The third one has a slope of 50 degrees to right. When a baby's ear touches its shoulder like this, it can be said as severe tilt. By what age are babies able to maintain a normal head and neck posture? According to Denver Developmental Test, babies starts to control their head and neck at the age of 3-4 months. Head control has been completed by the age of 6 months. Therefore, after 6 months of age, the head and neck should be maintained straight most of the daytime, except when babies are sleepy, ill or zone out. This shows normal head and neck position, where the line connecting the two eyes is horizontal to the ground. This baby is 7 months old, and he shows severe head tilt on right side. Since the baby's ear touches his shoulder, it can be said as severe tilt. In general, torticollis means a state in which the head and neck which is supposed to be symmetric has lost its symmetry. In a narrow sense, torticollis means rotation of the head and neck on the horizontal plane. When the head and neck is tilted to right or left side on the coronal plane, it is called lateroclis. When the head and neck is tilted forward or backward, it is called enterocolis and retrocolis, respectively. Therefore, torticollis means abnormal posture of the head and neck. In a broad sense, in a narrow sense, torticollis means rotation of the head and neck on the horizontal plane. This is the algorithm of differential diagnosis of torticollis. Since about half of torticollis are congenital muscular torticollis, the first step of differential diagnosis of torticollis is to find whether it is congenital muscular torticollis or not. Let's talk about congenital muscular torticollis. What is congenital muscular torticollis? Healthy and normal newborn babies have no lump or mass in the neck, especially in the sternocleidomastoid muscle. When there is a lump or mass in unilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle of the newborns, the most common diagnosis is congenital muscular torticollis. In congenital muscular torticollis, the lump of the unilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle usually causes shortening of the muscle, ending up with limitation of motion of the head and neck. This baby has right congenital muscular torticollis and looks uncomfortable when his head and neck is turned to the right, showing significant limitation of passive rotation of the neck toward the shoulder of the shortened the sternocleidomastoid muscle. However, a lump in unilateral neck of a newborn does not always mean congenital muscular torticollis. There are diseases or conditions mimicking congenital muscular torticollis and this must be differentiated from congenital muscular torticollis. Left picture shows a lump in the neck of a newborn baby and it looked like congenital muscular torticollis. However, it was not congenital muscular torticollis but an abscess in right sternocleidomastoid muscle. Right picture also looks like right congenital muscular torticollis but the MRI shows that it is a deep neck abscess below right sternocleidomastoid muscle. Two conditions need to be treated in a different way from congenital muscular torticollis. That is why the precise diagnosis is important. This five-month-old girl had a lump on right neck, and this lump was not congenital muscular torticollis but a malignant tumor in the neck. It also needs to be treated in a different way from congenital muscular torticollis. Therefore, when there is a lump or mass in the newborn's neck, you have to know that it is not always congenital muscular torticollis. Therefore, differential diagnosis is required using specific diagnostic methods such as ultrasonography or MRI. If you try to make a diagnosis only with palpation, misdiagnosis can be made. Ultrasonography is the first-line diagnostic method for congenital muscular torticollis. MRI could provide additional information when a diagnosis is difficult to be made by ultrasonography. MRI also provides useful information on making decision on surgical and non-surgical cases of congenital muscular torticollis. 
This is a typical ultrasonographic finding of congenital muscular torticollis. Left panel shows diffuse thickening of right sternocleidomastoid muscle with heterogeneous hyperechogeneity. Right panel shows normal left sternocleidomastoid muscle. When you see these findings of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, you can make the diagnosis of congenital muscular torticollis. This slide shows the MRI findings of congenital muscular torticollis. The upper row shows the MRI findings of mild non-surgical congenital muscular torticollis cases, showing thickened unilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle without any low signal intensities. The second and third rows show the MRI findings of severe surgical congenital muscular torticollis cases, showing large low signal intensity in the sternocleidomastoid muscle, characterized by black signals on both the T1-weighted and T2-weighted images. These black low signal intensity means presence of large amount of fibrosis within the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The 5.7-year-old girl had left congenital muscular torticollis. This child did not say that she had a lump in her neck, but the neck muscle was hard just like a boner stick. The MRI does not show significant thickness of left sternocleidomastoid muscle compared to the right. You can see that the left sternocleidomastoid muscle shows a large black signal of abnormal fibrous tissue, like this case. Sometimes the lump of congenital muscular torticollis in the newborn period no longer exists as a child grows. In severe cases of congenital muscular torticollis, the neck muscle of congenital muscular torticollis is not always thicker than the other side, but has lots of fibrosis in the sternocleidomastoid muscle shown as large black signal on the MRI. There are congenital muscular torticollis cases where they look like having chopsticks or stick in their neck. This picture shows three adults with severe surgical congenital muscular torticollis. The sternocleidomastoid muscle is no longer thicker, but it looks black on the MRI, showing the fibrous tissue. The third case in right shows that right sternocleidomastoid muscle is even thinner than left sternocleidomastoid muscle. It is not easy to define congenital muscular torticollis and there is no official definition on congenital muscular torticollis yet. You can't even say that congenital muscular torticollis is characterized by a lump in the neck. We analyzed the transcripts, a mRNA, of the surgical specimens of congenital muscular torticollis. The most differentially expressed genes were the fibrosis-related genes such as collagen fibrillogenesis and elastic fiber formation as well as the genes related with DNA damage responses. Based on the results of this study, congenital muscular torticollis might be defined as a developmental disorder of the sternocleidomastoid muscle characterized by fibrosis, ending up with shortening of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The prevalence of congenital muscular torticollis is reported differently depending on how it was diagnosed. The first-line diagnostic method on CMT is ultrasonography. In this study, the final diagnosis was made through the ultrasonography when there were clinical findings suspicious of congenital muscular torticollis in newborns. They reported that the prevalence of congenital muscular torticollis is estimated to be 1 to 1.4 per 100 newborns. Therefore, congenital muscular torticollis is a relatively common disease in newborns. What causes congenital muscular torticollis? Some people say that congenital muscular torticollis is caused by hematoma, ischemia or compartment syndrome. This is what we simulated on the normal vaginal delivery. The most common delivery position is left occiput anterior position. The occiput of a baby is in the mother's left and anterior side. During the normal delivery, the head comes out by turning both head and shoulders inward, then the shoulders come out by external rotation. In cesarean section, an incision is made in the uterus and the head, the anterior shoulder, and the entire child is delivered in that order. Getting back to congenital muscular torticollis, why does hematoma, ischemia or compartment syndrome occur in the normal vaginal delivery or cesarean section? For hematoma to occur, Trauma may be necessary such as hitting or striking the body. Externally, for ischemia to occur, the blood vessels of the sternocleidomastoid muscle need to be blocked, and it is not easy to block the thin small blood vessels selectively. Why does compartment syndrome occur in children who are born normally via the vaginal delivery or cesarean section without any trauma or diseases? 
In general, when it comes to what causes congenital muscular torticollis, some people say that a baby can get caught in the birth canal. If a baby is caught in the birth canal, it probably is the head or shoulders. The neck is thinner than the head or shoulders, so it is unlikely that a baby's neck is caught in the birth canal. There are cases where vacuum suction or forceps are used. In this case, since a baby cannot come down out of the birth canal by itself, the baby needs to be pulled out using these assistive methods. During the assistive delivery, a hematoma or ischemia could occur by stretching. When edema is severe along with hematoma or ischemia, compartment syndrome could occur. This slide shows shoulder dystocia, where the baby's shoulder was caught in the birth canal. We call that shoulder dystocia. In the case of shoulder dystocia, congenital muscular torticollis may occur helping the shoulders to come out by pulling the baby's head and neck, ending up with stretching the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the neck. However, how does congenital muscular torticollis occur during a normal delivery without vacuum suction, forceps delivery, or shoulder dystocia? This is a proposed mechanism of congenital muscular torticollis during the vaginal delivery, when a baby's head comes out. Both the head and shoulders turn together at the same time. However, in this step, if only the head without the shoulders turns inward, the sternocleidomastoid muscle may be stretched like this. Congenital muscular torticollis rarely occurs in preterm babies. Probably there are enough space in the womb for a baby to move. A baby can move the head and neck to right or left in the womb when the posture is uncomfortable. The head and neck need to come back to a comfortable position. However, around the end of pregnancy, the baby grows and there might not be enough space for a baby to move the head and neck to a comfortable position. The baby's head and neck could get caught in this position, ending up with the sternocleidomastoid muscle stretched. Congenital muscular torticollis occurs. This mechanism can explain how congenital muscular torticollis occurs in babies born via cesarean section or normal vaginal delivery. If you choose a cesarean section, would congenital muscular torticollis not occur? The answer is no. Congenital muscular torticollis occurs in babies born via not only vaginal delivery but also cesarean section. The severity of congenital muscular torticollis is not that different between vaginal delivery and cesarean section. There might be hematoma, ischemia, or compartment syndrome in the sternocleidomastoid muscle with congenital muscular torticollis. For these, whatever mechanism is involved, the sternocleidomastoid muscle needs to get stretched in the womb or during delivery. As a result of stretching, damages on the sternocleidomastoid muscle might occur with excessive stretching of unilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle. The downstream events such as hematoma, ischemia, or compartment syndrome could occur, ending up with congenital muscular torticollis. Let's take a look at the symptoms of congenital muscular torticollis. The primary symptom of congenital muscular torticollis is shortening of unilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle, causing contralateral rotation and ipsilateral tilting of the head and neck. Children who have unilateral shortening of the sternocleidomastoid muscle for a long time try to maintain a normal head and neck posture by either raising one shoulder or bending the neck shown in these pictures. Therefore, People with congenital muscular torticollis eventually could have uneven shoulder or cervical scoliosis. This is one of the secondary symptoms of congenital muscular torticollis. Since a baby has difficulty to turn the head to the side of congenital muscular torticollis due to shortening of the muscle, the baby would turn the head to the other side more often, resulting in flathead plagiocephaly like this. This is a finding showing asymmetric cheekbones in a child with congenital muscular torticollis. The sternocleidomastoid muscle attaches to the mastoid process on the skull. In congenital muscular torticollis, short sternocleidomastoid muscle plays much traction force on the mastoid process. It makes the mastoid process bigger compared to the other side without congenital muscular torticollis. The mastoid process is not that visible when the hair covers the skull but it needs to be known that congenital muscular torticollis can cause the hypertrophy of the mastoid process. Scoliosis also occurs in congenital muscular torticollis. This is a 7-year-old girl with right congenital muscular torticollis, showing scoliosis as one of secondary symptoms.
hear you, can also see asymmetry of the head and neck junction. This is called craniovertebral junction abnormality. Craniovertebral junction abnormality is one of secondary symptoms of congenital muscular torticollis. While left picture shows normal craniovertebral junction, right pictures show craniovertebral junction abnormality shown in severe cases of congenital muscular torticollis. Therefore, the primary symptom of congenital muscular torticollis is shortening of unilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle. If it persists for a long time, secondary musculoskeletal symptoms can occur, such as plagiocephaly, facial asymmetry, scoliosis and craniovertebral junction abnormality. Congenital muscular torticollis is a simple disease. However, if it is not treated properly, it can cause various symptoms and can severely affect the growth and development of children. What happens if congenital muscular torticollis is left untreated? There are cases in which treatment cannot be performed for various reasons. This slide shows the consequences of neglected congenital muscular torticollis of a 24-year-old patient. You can see short right sternocleidomastoid muscle, causing the head tilting to right side. You can also notice enlarged right mastoid process, asymmetric cheekbones and craniovertebral junction abnormality. This is a 52-year-old female patient with left congenital muscular torticollis. The MRI shows that left sternocleidomastoid muscle is not thicker anymore, but rather thinner compared to right side. She has severe left head tilt and scoliosis. You can also notice enlarged left mastoid process asymmetric let left cheekbone and craniovertebral junction abnormality. Today, I talked about congenital muscular torticollis along with a normal head and neck posture, diagnosis, prevalence, symptoms, etiology of congenital muscular torticollis were reviewed. Thank you for watching this video. See you next time.